Thank you so much for loving me so much that you would send your son to die on the cross for us. As we open up your word, God, I pray that you speak to us, God, and change us on the inside so we can share your love on the outside to those that are around us that we come in contact with every single day. God, I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. You know, when the doctor calls you to that meeting and you know it's bad news. And the doctor knows it and you know it. And nobody wants that meeting, but it has to happen. And the doctor calls you into his office and he says, you have cancer. And this is an unenviable role, and nobody trains doctors well to do that. And I have a similar duty today. Because what we are going to talk about today is division in the church. More particularly, division in this church. You see, COVID has left a mark on us. Not just the chaos and the confusion of information, but it has created two camps, sometimes more than two camps, but certainly two. And uh, I was on one side of the camp, I will confess, where I was minimizing what it was, what it could do, and I was acting as if it was never going to happen to me. So then something happened. I got COVID. Then I kind of went the other way, and I said, you know, this is really, really, really real. This is really serious. And many of you prayed for me and loved me through this, and my wife as well, because both of us felt that we were closer to heaven than we were on this earth at times during that time. And uh, afterwards, something interesting happened. So afterwards, I felt a tug of war. So this side was saying, now, now, now don't, lose, don't lose it, brother. I mean, you know, it's, it's nothing. It's no problem. I mean, you know, it's the government's, you know, whatever, you know, this side. Of, and you're still one of us, right? Then there were people on this side saying, now, now, wait a second, now that you got COVID, you're one of us, aren't you? I mean, we're going to listen to the science, and we're going to listen to the doctors, and you're going to warn people to be careful. And it wasn't just that there's two opinions, but this side is pointing fingers at them and calling them fearful, unspiritual. This side is pointing at them saying, irresponsible, uncaring, unloving, ignorant. And I heard one yesterday that I must say, because it's just, it just must be said, weird, strange. I thought this was over. I really thought that, you know, when the mask came off, this was going to be over and we we're going to be just be able to get rid of it, sweep it under the rug of history and just move on with our new building and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I realized COVID has weakened us. COVID has wounded us. And if we dare sweep it under the rug of history and try to move on like nothing happened, we will move with weakness with sickness, and we will continue to be unhealthy until we look in the mirror and we are able to say with honesty, with sincerity, we are divided. And, and you know, not that we're going to change your opinion. I don't intend to, and I don't think these two sides are intending to change their opinions, but there's something, and only because Jesus said it, am I here this morning, 
there's something that can transcend our differences. And I'm glad that we had the bread and the cup because that is it. The blood of Christ unites us in ways that eliminates the differences between us. So yes, there is a rift, there is a division, and we must hear the call to unity today. But first we must confront the fact of this unity, the reality of this unity, and the sickness that is brought among us. And not shirk it off and say, oh, it's nothing, it's no big deal, let's just suppress it, deny it, move on. Well, we have a little baggage when it comes to unity. You see, there's many other causes for disunity, and our past is marred with many of these instances, and you can see them up here. Doctrine. Oh, that's a favorite of mine. I used to divide over that all the time. I used to tell people they were wrong, and I used to love to correct them, and uh, I still do kind of, but <laughs> be honest. But the reality is I have learned that there was pride in my allegiance to truth in correcting brothers and sisters in Christ who might believe differently than me, but they were my brothers and sisters in Christ and they love Jesus just as much or not, if not more than I do. So yes, we must divide, as someone told me in between services. Is there ever a time to divide? And yes, but most of the times that we divide are for minor, non-essential doctrines, not the ones that truly matter. But then we go to music and the color of the carpet and the color of the walls. Yes, churches have divided over that in the past. Not ours, fortunately, but it has happened and it can happen. Cultural differences, generational differences, social issues, politics. Somehow I can say that COVID has managed to intertwine the medical side with the political aspects and the social aspects, all into one tight mess. Unresolved relational issues, and I must, I must pause here because unrelational issues, you understand, I mean, people get offended and they, you know, they kind of sit over there now and this person sits over here because they're offended with that person who said this about them. But COVID has left some unresolved relational issues here. What you've said about the other side hasn't been said into a void. It's hurt people. It's touched people. It's wounded people. And you know, it's not that hard. The Bible tells us to resolve them. And it's, fortunately for us, it doesn't mean you have to not have your opinion in order to resolve it. But you do have to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And maybe we can seek to understand and listen better. Ministry styles, difficult personalities in Mexico, there's, there's something, there's a saying that we have. And uh, when somebody is a difficult person, we say, oh, he's special. <laughs> so when you hear me say about you that you're special, be careful. <laughs> Kevin. I just want you to know you're real special to me, <laughs> just special, just really special. So, but you know what? It's about faces, right? It's easy to, to talk about stuff out there and, and facts and information and, and, and what we believe. But when you see a face and you have to reject that person, this is, becomes a little more real. So I want you to see some faces that are different than ours. And behind these faces, there's different the theological positions, different taste in music, different generational culture, different, different thinking altogether. My question is, if they were your brother or sister in Christ, would you accept them? Maybe I have to ask them, would they want to accept you? But it's about people, isn't it? It's about people. 
I were to summarize the sermon in a sentence today, it would be this. God wants our church to experience spiritual unity so that the world around us may come to know Jesus. God wants our church to experience spiritual unity so that the world around us may come to know Jesus. I didn't realize, honestly, how, how much the two were intertwined. I always thought that unity was here and the gospel was here. And so I often separated the two, but God has brought them together and I, in a way for me that I will never be the same. I hope you too by the end of our time together. So let's go to the first important truth about unity, and that is this. It is God's will for us to experience perfect spiritual, in parenthesis, relational unity. Let's read these verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about them. I, I, I need to want to get into the scripture. But as we do, as we get into John 17, I want you to know that John 13 through 17 forms something called the Upper Discourse, which has happened uh, during or right after the Lord's Supper or including the Lord's Supper because John 13 introduces the Lord's Supper and Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. But then he says things there in that upper room that are so critical. And he ends that time with a prayer in front of the disciples who are arguing, by the way, at this point, who is the greatest in the kingdom? So if you think that division is only true of this church, you're in good company. The disciples were one of the most dis ununited or dis divided groups of all time. And so Jesus prays this prayer in the upper room, and it is said that this is like the inner sanctum of the Bible. This is the place where the Holy of Holies, our high priest, goes into that place with his father and has this moment of amazing intimacy in a prayer that we cannot deny its power or its importance in our lives. So let's join this prayer as we kind of take a peek into it. We're not going to take all of it. We're just going to read some of it because we don't have much time this morning. So let's pray. Let's look at this together. And before we do, let's pray and ask God to do his work in our lives. Lord, use your word. Penetrate our hearts. Penetrate the armor of fear and anger that often causes division. And fill it with your love and with your power and with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So here it is. Jesus praying. He says, I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, that would be his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their message, that would be us. May they all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. May they also be one in us. So the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, I always thought that that last part portion when it says you have loved them, it meant the world. But it's not. When you look at the grammar, it's going back to the disciples. It's saying, so may the world know that you have sent me and you have loved them, the church, as you have loved me. So they're looking on 
to this relationship, both vertical and horizontal, and they're just amazed because they see the love of God that he has for his church. And they see the love that the church has for one another, and they are jealous. They want that. And so they are looking on from the outside to this concert of love. Now, Jesus prayed this prayer knowing the following truth from Ephesians. That is important to the context because Jesus accomplished unity by his sacrifice on the cross, as we can see here in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. And that was just a day away. That was just hours away. He was going to die on the cross. And later, Paul, as he writes about that fact, he recognizes that in some way the, 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 the prayer was answered by his sacrifice. And yet in another way, it's still yet to be completed. So it says here, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace who made both groups, we're talking about Gentiles on one side and Jews on the other, that were eternally divided, culturally divided. Um, they hated each other, in other words. He made both of these groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. Did they still find it hard to get along? Yes. Did they still fight? Yes. Did they still hate each other? Yes, often. But did they now have a reason to be united? Did, did they now have a bond through the sacrifice of Christ and the Holy Spirit that indwelled him to find a reason and a power to be united? Yes. So go back to John 17, but let's look at it in terms of a a diagram that I, I made up, a rough diagram that I try to understand what is happening. Because unity is not just a program, it's not a decision, it's not a place, but it's a journey, it's a process. So the process begins when those who believe in Jesus Christ, that's the church, okay? Unity, this unity cannot exist in the world. This can only exist in the church. And here's the reason why, because the believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that connects them to the Trinity. And so this unity involves the Trinity because remember it says, you know, unite, may they be one in us. So we can't do it without the Holy Spirit's presence, which is why we're calling it a spiritual unity because it necessitates, it demands the presence of the Holy Spirit, in fact, of the entire Trinity. They are not just the model of perfect unity. They are the source of unity. They are the power behind unity. If it's ever going to happen, in other words, it's going to be because of them. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, first of all, and because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we must understand that we are bankrupt without the Holy Spirit. The division that we have is just a small taste of the sin that is in our hearts. That the blood of Christ has covered, has forgiven, has perfected us in him. But we still have a long way to go in this world in order to reflect that unity that's in the Trinity. So there is a process of sanctification, which is why Jesus in that prayer, if you notice, he said, sanctify them in your truth. But what is the reason for the sanctification? What's the reason for this process? It's not just to make us happy. It's to make us one. So then that sanctification starts producing love, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? You look, go to Galatians 5, and it says love, peace, joy, right? Love is one of the first fruits of the Spirit. And so it starts to produce that, and love is something that grows. It's not just something we have on Mondays, but on Tuesdays it should be greater than Monday, and on Wednesday it should be even deeper than Monday. Because with every crisis, with every situation like this one, our love can grow deeper, just like trials in the marriage can make that marriage experience a more profound love than they ever had before, so in the church, the same can happen with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that unity, notice that the world is looking on to that unity, and the unity isn't in order to attract them. That's not it. It's not fake. It's real. Because it's based on the transformation of our character, the transformation of our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm loving you because I love you, not because, ooh, somebody's watching. 
I'm loving you because you're my brother and you're my sister in Christ. And even though you offend me, even though you hurt me, I can forgive you. Even though it's hard to get along sometimes, we can find unity based on the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ. Because that which unites us is stronger than that which divides us. We are not looking for uniformity. We are not looking for groupthink. We are not looking for people to give up their convictions. We're looking for people to love. So it is God's will for us to experience this perfect spiritual unity. Now, G Jesus says unity, one, one, and then he ends with this. I pray for this complete or perfect unity. You say, and he says, just as it's perfect within the Trinity, may it be perfect in the church. Is that ever going to happen? Yes or no? No. Sorry. But it is something we need to pursue. In other words, we never lower the bar. Matthew 5.48 says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are we ever going to be perfect as a heavenly Father? No. Not in this world. But should we ever stop pursuing that perfection? No. So perfect unity means that's the goal. We, we don't settle for less than that. We don't just simply say, oh, that's good enough. You know, he hates me, I hate him. That's cool. We're still here. We'll worship. The, I'll sing a song right next to him. I mean, you know, come on. What more does he want? We'll pray together, you know. We'll eat together. But, you know, I'm not going to ever forgive that. You know, I'm not ever going to, you know, well, they're on the other side. So we have to understand that this is not a divine suggestion. It's a prayer because it's a process, not because it's any less important as any command that Jesus gave. So how are we going to accomplish it? What is the power behind unity, the motor behind it? That's number two. Our unity must be empowered by God's love. John 17, 23, let's read some of these verses in front of us. Jesus says, I am them, you I am in them, and you are in me. May they be made completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I, and then verse 26, I made your name known to them and will make it known so the love you have loved me with may be in them, and I may be in them. Think of the power of that. We're talking about a love so transformational, so divine, so amazing. So not humanly possible that Jesus is in us in order to accomplish this. So do we have the power to love someone even if we don't like someone? Absolutely. What does God need for us to that, for that to happen? He needs for us to surrender our will. That's a biggie. He needs us to surrender our right to be right. So that we can allow that love to flow through us. But let's move on to other verses, even within that upper room discourse that are important that complement this. In John 13, Jesus said, and this is a command. Watch this. This is a new command. Wait a second. What's the old command? The old command is love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the standard is yourself. I know you love yourself, you take care of yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. But this is, he moved the goalpost to the impossible. He says, no, love, your, love one another. And now he's talking about the church, specifically. Just as I have loved you. That's the difference. That's why it's a new command. You must also love one another. Notice how he repeats it, like maybe they need to hear it again. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. Now the third time, just in case, you know, just in case you didn't hear it, Peter. If you have love for one another, the world will know. People will notice. You know they're watching you, right? You may not realize it, but they are. And then this is important right here because this is where we get that source of love. We know that Jesus loved 
loves us. We know that he loved us on this act of supreme sacrifice on the cross. But what about our daily life? What about now? What about Mondays? As the Father has loved me, John 15 says, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. So here's the choice we get. We understand that by the sacrifice of Christ, we are loved by God just as he loves his son, just the way John 17 says. So when God the Father said to, to Jesus in the baptism, remember, before he sent him out to the desert, he said, you are my son whom I love. Okay. He said this before he did anything in ministry, before he proved himself, before he worked before he did all the things that, you know, that, that might deserve love if it was about proving, deserving that love. But no, God the Father says, I love you. So in Christ, let me ask you the question, does God love you? You could nod, yes, okay. Does he love you on a bad day? Does he love you on a good day? Felipe, does he love you when you fail? You sure about that? Okay, we'll have to talk about this later. Okay. <laughs> Does he love you, Keith, when you and your wife are fighting? Not that you ever, ever, ever do. Does he still love you? Even if you haven't resolved that, that conflict, he still love you? Okay. So he does. But here's the choice we can make. When we sin, what do we want to do? We want to run in the opposite direction of love, right? We want to run to self-pity, to depression, to anxiety, to, you know, and then we start believing the lies that come with it, right? I am nothing. I am undeserving. I am stupid. I am dumb. I am unworthy. And we walk away from God's love. Not that he doesn't love us. He still loves us. But to remain in the love of Christ is to go to him every day as you go to a fountain of love that you need just as much as you need water and air that you breathe. Spending time with Jesus every day is the way that you get that love that's going to flow through you to the next person. If you don't have it, my friend, you're empty. He still loves you, but you don't have a whole lot of resource to give to others. The same way with, if you, if you talk about the fact that we need to spend time with Jesus every day, now, now, now take that and translate into, into the relationships with others. If Jesus says, I want you to love your brothers and sisters just as I have loved you. So when Jesus loved the disciples, okay, now we're talking about Jesus went and got the love of the Father every, every time he prayed. And he spent time in prayer with, with his Father all the time in the desert. But he also spent time loving his disciples. Was it once a week for like, a, like an hour he met his disciples and they sat down and they had a class and he, he used the whiteboard. And is that how it happened? How did it happen? Life on life. Every day. You know, I love to go on mission trips. On mission trips, you get to know a different side of people. You get to know the special side of people. <laughs> you know? Um, when they're a little smelly and a little bit, you know, a little rough. And, and, you know, maybe they wake up and they're not quite so happy, you know, as, as they are on Sunday mornings when they're all, you know, just ready for church, you know. And, and I think it's, it's wonderful because you get to know each other and you get, to, and I, I know, I know after a mission trip, I love these people more deeply than I did when the mission trip started. I mean, Felipe and I just went on a mission trip to Mexico City and that happened over there, didn't it? We saw the love of God grow in us and the missionaries together as we spent time together praying and crying and eating tacos. Good tacos, man. Fish tacos. Okay, I'm going to stop about food. But the point is we spent time with one another. So here's my challenge to you. If you, if you want to love your brother, your sister in Christ, the one who's sitting next to you, can you do it just on Sundays? Yes or no? No. What must you do? You tell me. How about going out for coffee, going out for a donut, going out for, you know, peanut butter sandwich, or, you know, my, my wife said the peanut butter sandwich part. I, I'll give that her credit for that. Co anything. We need to spend time with one another. We need to get to know each other. 
How will two warring factions, two sides come together? By talking and understanding each other. By listening to each other. And then that love that Christ gave you that morning when you went to him and you received that love will flow through you to your brothers and sisters. And then they will, you will begin to see the miracle, the miracle of spiritual unity happen in, in our midst. Let's go to the third. Our love must have as its goal to encourage one another to move closer to Christ. In John 17, 17, we see this verse that talks about the fact that we need to be sanctified by the truth. And in this context as well, it tells us that we have received the glory of Christ, and we have it. We have all the glory. We don't need any more glory than what has received, than what we received when we were saved. However, that glory is dimmed by our sin and begins to shine every day all the more when we grow in him. The same glory, it's just, it just begins to shine a little more when we surrender to him, when we follow him, when we listen to him, when we have times of intimacy with him, when we walk with him. It begins to show, and this is what Second Corinthians is talking about, that process of, of sanctification where glory begins to be more reflected in our lives that says we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. And we exhort you, brothers, like 1 Thessalonians 5.14, warn those who are responsible, comfort the discouraged, and help the weak, and be patient with everyone. And Instead of criticizing, instead of shaming, instead of pointing out other people's fault, and there's a, a, little, a little graph I can show you real quick that talks about that. We can warn, we can comfort, we can help. But we need to understand where that person is so that we know how to help them. Some people who are just outright rebellious, they need a warning, right? They need to be told, come on, the cliff is coming, the cliff is coming, you're going to fall. Those who are just a little weak in the knees and need a little encouragement, they need someone to come alongside and say, you can do it as you push them toward the image of Christ. And then there are those who need, just need help. Stop the sermonizing. Don't say a word. Just help them. There are times like that. When someone is grieving, they don't need a sermon. They just need you to be there right beside them. And so a united church moves towards Christ-likeness Affirming, accepting, encouraging, forgiving, loving people. The divided church sits back and condemns because it's about are you, are you uh, fulfilling that list that we have? Are you, are, you, you know, are you not drinking, not going to the movies, and not chewing whatever, tobacco, and, and going out with girls who do? I mean, is that, is that, are, you, are you fulfilling our code of conduct? And, and if you're not, then you're shamed or shunned or criticized or rejected. In a divided church, it's about who's different, who doesn't conform, who is not the same as everybody else. Those are the people that you point out and you say, you're not the same. You're different. You're not welcome here. I love our ministry to the homeless because it's about being with people who are different and loving them for who they are and not judging them for what they look like, but looking at the heart inside. So let's go to the fourth point. Perfect spiritual unity looks like earthly revival and heavenly worship. So this is possible. We are still in the book of Acts, people. This is just the beginning of the book of Acts, and look what Jesus did. Look what the Holy Spirit did in the church, and he can still do that today. So here's what it is. They were under persecution. They prayed the church, mind you. This is about the church, not about the leaders, not about the singers. This is about the church. This is about you. They had prayed, and the place that they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak God's message with boldness. 
Now the large group of those who believed were of one mind and heart, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. And the apostles were giving testimony with great power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them, for there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and this was then distributed to each person's basic needs. This is oneness. It's a picture of oneness in the church, sharing, finding out what the need is and meeting those needs. But look what happened after that. They were being persecuted, mind you. They were being singled out by the government. And none of them, those who were looking, dared to join them because they were afraid of being a part of the persecution on the wrong side of the fence. And yet, the people were praising them highly. They saw the love that was among them, and they were amazed, and they were attracted. And believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, crowds of both men and women. There, there was an impact, and we can have an impact. And in Revelation, it talks about the fact that one day there will be people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, separate, still different tribes and nations, still divided by culture, but united by Christ, worshiping in heaven. That's the perfect picture that Jesus is looking for from us. Is it possible? Yes. Will it take work? Yes. Is it going to be easy? No. When can we start? How about yesterday? Listen to these words. One of the most well-known Bible stories is when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt. They find themselves backed up against the Red Sea and the Egyptian army is pursuing them and they are just terrified because there's nothing they can do. It's impossible. But then Moses says something in Exodus 14, verse 14. He says, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. That's when God parts the Red Sea and he does the impossible and, and the people are saved. The church is in an impossible situation right now. You see, Jesus prayed in John 17 that everyone who believed in him would become perfectly one, perfectly united, just as the Father and Son are perfectly one. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we are the most divided faith group on earth. About a silent, reverent, awe. What if we could humble ourselves? Like everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and died on the cross for their sins. It's, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's, it's about whatever you want. recognize if I believe that you sent your son to die for me so that I could be forgiven of my sin and that his death was supposed to bring us together and that's what you want and God I want whatever you want I'll do whatever you want me to do As we did that as individuals, then we could come together. 
What if God could look down one day and just, he could see his children truly in awe of him, huddled together in, in groups all around the world just to marvel at him. Just to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, in heaven, everyone gets it. They can see him. And they're just in Oh, there's just this unified awe over him. Our only hope right now is that we beg God together and we say, Lord, we want it to be like it is in heaven united around your throne. We want that right now, right here on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to spend a few moments just reflecting about um, maybe what God's speaking to you about this morning. Uh, specifically with the, in regards to unity. So we got, we're going to continue in our worship, but I want you guys to spend some time and reflect on what God's speaking to you about this morning. Oh 
contributing to this unity in, in this church, in my life, by my attitudes, by my desire to be right. I surrender that to you so that you can transform me into your presence, into your image, and help me to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us all, Lord, to surrender any part of our hearts that needs that today. Our wills, our minds, our attitudes. We give them to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. There was one slide I wanted to do, Justin, the one about the, the choice we have to make. I had forgotten about that. I just want to put it before you as you leave. We have a choice to make. This unity, we can continue to allow the forces of this unity in our church by yielding to our sinful flesh and the influence of Satan. And don't you think that Satan is not involved in this whole process? And give the, the world an excuse not to believe in Jesus. Or we can do this. We can commit to pursue relational unity in the power of the Holy Spirit, in order to demonstrate the power of God's love and consequently attract the world to believe in Jesus. The choice is yours. Go with him. Amen.